Hey there, my name is Chris Nelson. I'm the founder of Rolling Fortunes, and I wanna welcome you to this course all about doing video content creation specifically for YouTube to drive sales and success in your business. Uh, I actually started my first company in 2009, and over that time, from then until now, I've used YouTube content marketing to drive $20 million in product sales to my retail e-commerce websites. And we're talking Google Analytics, last click attribution. So that's like the bare minimum. It's probably closer to 50 or 60 or $80 million in actual attributed sales, but it's such a powerful tool. I wanna take you along with everything I've learned from then until now so that you can learn from my experience where I'm at today so that you can get a jump start on using video content marketing to supercharge your business. I'm gonna tell you the tips and tricks that I've learned along the way. I'm gonna tell you what the best practices are for things like titles, thumbnails, descriptions, how to use knowledge about SEO, um, how to link to the products on your website, how to actually make the videos and upload them. So this is part one. In part one, we're going to talk about the strategy of YouTube and video content creation and things like that. And then in this course, there's a part two where we actually talk to my friend Josh all about camera gear, what you should buy as a beginner. Um, if you already have something you wanna level up, what does that look like? So if you need help with your equipment, go watch that video. If you wanna learn about strategy and best practices and actually how to do it and make it work, watch this video. When I first started using YouTube videos for marketing to my e-commerce retail websites, the reason I did it is because I was selling a product that I knew the customer would appreciate seeing up close. So my thought process was, how do I best replicate an in-person experience? So I put myself in their shoes and my shoes as a consumer, you go to a store, you find the thing that you want to buy, you pick it up, you look at it, you might feel it, you might touch it, you might knock on it to uh, find out how it's built, things like that. You might shake it, um, you might get a feel for the product in its quality and things like that. And you just can't do that in e-commerce as well as you can in person, obviously. Everybody has a website with photos and a title and a description, but not everybody has a, a video that gives the customer an in-depth look at the product as if they were standing there touching and feeling it themselves. So that was really the reason that I chose to do YouTube uh, video content marketing. The other thing that I found out that happened because I did this for so long is I became known as the expert in that field and people would just start believing me without me having to really sell them anything. I took the approach of teaching and education, just the facts, real world, unbiased, truth telling. And I would show, here's the product, here's what it does, here's what's good about it, here's what's bad about it, and then I might compare it to another product. Here's the other option, here's what it does, here's what's good about it, here's what's bad about it. And then I would let the viewers make up their own decisions, but I would sell both products on my website. Sometimes, you know, it's important to give your opinions and a recommendation, but largely what I tried to do was take a more educational stance and that worked really, really well because it made my viewers feel like they had an ally, which they did. Every single product that I would sell on my website would get a video. That was my strategy. And when I found a website that got more views than others, that's the kind of video then that I would kind of tailor the rest of my content towards. So. It was a slow evolution that actually required me to make a lot of videos. So I think that we made close to 200 to 300 videos a year. Today, me and my team make closer to 600 videos a year because my team is a full-time videography team with a full-time professional studio and a support staff. And we create content for up to seven different e-commerce websites. And so in this video, I'm gonna break it down, everything that I've learned from top to bottom. So make sure you download the study guide that I'm actually using to you know, follow along with this video so that you can have it also. 
This is perfect if you're the type of person that likes to take notes or you know gets distracted easily. You download the study guide and you're going to follow right along with me. Let's jump in. Section one, start with credentials. You might have noticed in this video, I started out with who I am and maybe why you should listen to me. And I think that that's really powerful and something that you should do in your videos right now for selling products through e-commerce. The reason is you need to give people a reason to trust you, to believe you, that you should have authority. How do you do that? You should listen to me about this topic because I've been making YouTube videos since 2009. We've driven over $20 million in direct e-commerce sales from YouTube to my websites. And every single year, my videos get about 19 million views all in. That's made up of 564,000 hours of watch time every single year. So think about the number of people who have seen the content that me and my team have created. 19 million views, 564,000 hours of watch time. That's huge. I know what I'm doing and it's working really well and I wanna teach it to you. So you see what I did there? Like I tried to frame the conversation about why you should listen to me in the first place. So hopefully now you believe that I'm the expert and you can use an example of what I did for your own purposes. Maybe it's something like I've been doing this for 10 years. I've had this kind of success. Um, I grew up doing this kind of a thing or I've tested more of these products than anybody else, or I went to school as an engineer and I really know how things work. Whatever it is for your case, tr especially when you're first starting out and people don't really know you, use that kind of information to frame the audience perception of who you are so that they believe you. I actually wanna show you one of my first ever YouTube videos. This is so embarrassing because I started my first company in like a 20 square foot spare bedroom in the basement of my house back in the day and I had this little desk in the corner and I would put my camera tripod in front of me, kind of like between my feet on the floor and then the camera would be in front of me and my arms would reach around it and I would actually show you what I'm talking about. I'd point to things, I'd tap on it to give you a sense of the material. Um, I would educate you and tell you everything that I know and the crazy thing is I caught a wave where nobody was doing this for the products that I was selling so I was the first and I was giving people really good information that they needed. And I just kept evolving this process over time until I got to something like what you see today. This video here is an evolution of that first video in that dimly lit basement room. And the message is your video might look like my terrible first video and that's okay. You just have to start because starting and doing is part of experience and you need experience if you're gonna get better than where you are today. I have a really simple rule in business, it's do something, just do something. And if it works, keep doing it, go down that path. If it doesn't work, stop doing it, do something else. But the key word is you have to start. To find success in YouTube video content marketing, there's really three rules. You have to uh, be consistent, you need to be posting on a regular basis. If you wait a month and then post, and then the next month you post four times and then you don't go, you don't post anything for three months, like that's not going to work. YouTube wants it to be consistent because the algorithm bases visibility and virality on a building process. So if you skip, you actually start wearing down, kind of like how bodybuilders that are consistent and they're working out every single day and they get huge and they're winning competitions and then they stop for a year, their muscle mass shrinks. And the same kind of thing happens with your potential on YouTube. You need to be consistent with posting. Your videos also need to be as high quality as you can make them. You may not have the equipment and the space to make something that looks like this, but do your best. A lot of people believe that if they just shoot with their camera and they don't care what the background looks like, it's gonna work. Sure, maybe, but for most people in most situations, you have to try to make the quality good. So that's more important than I think a lot of people believe. But I believe that the number one rule in having success on YouTube videos with content marketing is to add value. You can do that in a few ways. You can teach something, 
which is generally the approach that I take. I mean, you're watching this course today because I love teaching people things that I've learned and that I'm good at and that I've experienced. Or you can entertain, you can add value by entertaining. This might be uh, prank videos, this might be meme videos, this might be vlogging, or you can you know, provide news or information. You know, however you wanna interpret add value is up to you. So that's based on your content, your channel, your personality. For me, I like to teach things. Your experiences in life are different than mine and different than everybody else's. What you've experienced, how you see the world gives you a unique perspective that may help other people figure out what they want to learn. So for teaching, it's important to realize that something that you know that's in your head might actually be really useful for somebody else. So don't let the doubt get in the way that everybody knows what I'm trying to teach because they don't. You'd be surprised at things that you think are common knowledge that other people really need help with. And when it comes to getting answers to questions, YouTube is the number two search engine in the world, only next to Google, which also owns YouTube. So figuring out the answer to a question, making a video about it and putting it on YouTube is a great way for people to be looking for something you're talking about. If it's a product, it goes like this. This product exists, this product exists, this product exists, which one should I buy? Which one is cheaper? Which one is lighter? Which one has a better warranty? Which one is higher quality? All five of those questions can be turned into YouTube videos for the product you're selling. Let's say you're selling video cameras. You would get the video cameras that you sell and maybe one that you don't sell because it's really bad quality and you would compare them for specific questions. Don't answer everything about everything. Break it up into different segments so that when people ask a specific question, you have a video. You have to think in your head, how do I search on YouTube and Google? What do I actually type? What do people actually type? I'm not going to write something like the best camera because that's really vague and it's really uh, subjective. I'm, I might say, what is the least expensive or cheapest Sony photography camera? You see, so there's some really, really specific keywords and you want to teach something about those keywords for your video. Something like photo and video is huge. So if that's what your channel is about, you might get a lot of subscribers. But if your channel is specifically about a specific breed of dog and you teach people the best dog foods, the best leashes, the best gates for inside your house, the best dog kennels, whatever it is, and it's very specific, you probably won't get a lot of followers. Now, if you have a teaching video that's about a specific niche, you're gonna get a lot of followers from that niche. And so your expected audience size is relative to the, the size of the enthusiasts in that niche. If it's a specific dog type and you're educating people about uh, grooming habits and health and food and the best leash and whatever, the best exercise regimen for this specific dog, you're, getting, you're going to get a lot of people who are enthusiasts or love that dog to come watch your video, but how many people are there? You're gonna get a certain percentage of that audience to follow you and subscribe to your videos. Now, if you have something really boring, but it is uh, something that everybody experiences, let's say vacuum cleaners. Raise your hand if you're a vacuum enthusiast. I don't think that's really a thing outside of like professional vacuum uh, you know, companies um, or founders or something. So if it's not an enthusiast topic, you're not going to get a lot of followers. Now, if you say we're a sports channel, that is enthusiast, that is huge, that is very broad, but there's so many people that want to follow something about sports, football, baseball, basketball, soccer, um, you're gonna get a lot of followers there. So. When you're thinking about who you want the audience to be, do you care about how many followers? Do you care about how many views? The cool thing about your vacuum channel is pretty much everybody owns a vacuum and a lot of people have questions about their vacuum. So you could go out and spend, you know, a, a couple thousand dollars and get 10 different vacuum cleaners and bring them to your house and do all these different tests and say, which one has the most sucking power? Which one 
cleans up uh, flour that I spilled on the floor the, the best? Which one cleans up you know, dirt that I tracked in from the garden the best? Which one is easiest to change the filter on? And so you could make, you know, out of 10 vacuum cleaners, you could probably make 50 or 60 pieces of content that answer a question that a lot of people have. So you probably get a lot of views and you're probably going to drive a lot of traffic to your website to sell whatever it is that you're selling. But I wouldn't expect a whole lot of subscribers. On the flip side, if you have something that's based on entertainment, let's say a prank channel or a celebrity vlog or, you know, something really, really interesting that people just love to watch, you probably get a lot of subscribers and a lot of views. But then the trade-off is if you're not selling anything, you're not going to make a ton of money outside of AdSense or brand partnerships. And we're specifically talking about driving traffic from YouTube to an e-commerce website to sell something. Think of it this way. If you have a question about a vacuum cleaner, let's say you own a Dyson vacuum cleaner and you want to know how to replace the air filter. What are you going to search in Google or in YouTube? How to replace the air filter on my Dyson, whatever part number, vacuum. When you get the video, you're going to watch it and you're going to skip to the part where you want to actually learn something where it actually answers your question. This person has a minute and a half long intro about all the cool things about Dyson and their experience. I don't care. I'm not interested in engaging with you. I just want the answer to my question. So then they're going to show you this 30 to 60 second section about the actual thing you came to the video for. And then if they aren't selling the air filter, you're going to consume that information and click the X and leave. You're not going to subscribe to somebody explaining to you how to do a thing that's not enthusiast related. But there's a lot of ways to make money on YouTube. So we'll get to those different methods of, of income stream generation in a minute. But first, let's talk about a different channel type. Instead of teaching, let's talk about entertaining. Everyone has their favorite YouTube star or YouTube channel or YouTube celebrity that they like to watch that is entertaining, funny or interesting or exciting. And they have a regular schedule of when the content is put out. And you know when that's going to come out. Every Tuesday or every Monday morning or every Saturday night or whatever. Saturday Night Live is actually a really good example of how the old media on NBC or CBS or Fox or whatever is actually finding just as much, if not more success and views on YouTube as they are on their traditional media channel. Think about it. YouTube is the new television. YouTube is the new mass media. And the crazy thing is you and I can get in on it too. This is a really interesting point in time that we're going to look back at the history books as the shift from watching television to watching YouTube. Back then, the barrier to entry into an entertainment-style TV show was very expensive. You needed to have entire companies with entire production studios with big budgets and advertising, and you needed to get into the television studios and into the television programming. You had to work out contracts, all that kind of stuff. It was very difficult. Today, anybody can have the same type of influence, impact, and value reward as what we grew up watching on television. And that's crazy. And it's really, really exciting. So if you're one of those people who wants to make an entertainment type YouTube channel, your luck, it's totally possible. It just takes uh, quality, consistency, and value. It seems like every year a new YouTuber rises to stardom and their life has changed forever just because they're interesting, funny, entertaining. And, you know, some examples of these types of content would be, first one that comes to mind is Casey Neistat. He's a vlogger. So he would grab his camera, run around New York City, talk about a day in the life. And he was very interesting. It was fun to watch, fun to listen to. His life was interesting. And he just took us along for the ride. But he wasn't just funny. He was interesting. Another approach to it is produced and planned out funny skits. Uh, something that comes to mind here is uh, Dude Perfect, where they think about a trick shot that they're going to do and they practice it a million times. And when they've got it figured out, then they actually film it and show you. And it's super fun. They're shooting arrows down a hall at balloons or they're, uh, you know, kicking a basketball from 100 feet away and they make it perfectly. Or Mr. Beast, you know, the biggest YouTuber in the world right now, he plans out 
videos with his team months in advance and then brings to the table a perfectly produced funny skit or event. Another way that you can have an entertaining channel that's gonna get a lot of views and a lot of subscribers is something like commentary. The one that comes to mind here are Meet Kevin or Philip DeFranco or Graham Stephan. All of these guys have a talking head style YouTube channel where every few days they talk about current events and put their spin on it and tell you what to think, tell you what they know, tell you what they think, and it helps people understand the world around them just like traditional news. You can also get into the world of streaming, like what we see with PewDiePie or Ninja, where it's fun because you're watching them game and you're watching them interact with people and their commentary on the game or whatever it is that they're doing is really entertaining. They're not necessarily selling anything specifically, but they're getting a lot of views, which opens up other opportunities. You can also get into the world of podcasting. Uh, something that comes to mind instantly is Logan Paul with his podcast Impulsive, where him and a bunch of interesting people sit around a table and they talk and talk and talk about funny things, interesting things, gossip, world events, and you can do that to your heart's content if you're interesting enough for people to tune into on a regular basis and watch for the entire thing. And then speaking of the Paul brothers, you can also get into lifestyle influencer type entertainment videos. So two that come to mind are, you know, Logan's brother, Jake Paul, He's traveling the world and causing all kinds of drama. He's not sitting down in a podcast. He's just letting you see his life. It's candid. It's wild. It's dramatic. Or, I mean, I know they fell off, but like the Island Boys, they were getting a lot of attention just by showing their crazy off-the-cuff life. So there's a whole bunch of different ways that you can get attention on YouTube and make money. Now, even if you don't have a product to sell on a website, you can do things like brand deals. You can do things like product placement. You can do shout outs. You can also make a lot of money on advertising. So, you know, YouTube is the best platform for monetizing and making a lot of money from their program called AdSense. And all it takes is views. You get views. The more views you get, the more money you make. So think about it that way. You don't have to direct people to a website to make money on YouTube. All right, now let's shift and talk about SEO strategy on YouTube. SEO stands for search engine optimization. We're gonna talk about titles. We're gonna talk about descriptions. We're gonna talk about thumbnails. We're gonna talk about tags and explain why all of these things are super important to make sure that your videos get found and seen and grow. It is estimated that over 122 million people get on the YouTube platform every single day, which comes out to about 2.3 billion monthly users. That is one of the biggest digital opportunities that we've ever seen. How many people can you reach with a billboard each day? How many people drive by? It's a lot in some areas, but definitely not 122 million. How much does it cost to put up that billboard? a few thousand dollars a month, up to $100,000 a month, depending on the placement. Okay, how many people can see your YouTube videos and how much does that cost? Think about the return on investment for having a popular YouTube channel. It is the number one biggest opportunity for most entrepreneurs and businesses. If you can just get a fraction of that viewership, we're talking 250 million hours of YouTube videos consumed every single day. How much of that could you get? A fraction of a percent still is a huge potential. 81% of global internet users have watched YouTube. 43% of YouTube users access the site every month, and the average visitor spends at least 40 minutes on this platform. This is a huge audience, and 51% of them say they use YouTube to get answers to questions or to learn how to do something. And 90% of consumers say that they have used YouTube to find new products or new brands. So think about it like this. If you are uh, selling a certain product that helps people jumpstart their car and you have a consumer who is looking for a solution to that problem, they might go to Google and search and find a review website or they might go to YouTube 
And if your video pops up, this consumer doesn't have to ever have heard of you before. They might find your video. They might like how you talk, like what you say, like your presentation. They're going to see that in the description, you have a link to buy it. They like your review. They're just going to trust this guy on the internet that they just met and buy it right then and there. It's literally that easy, but you have to put in the work and create the content. I wanted to show you all these statistics just to demonstrate how huge of an opportunity it is for you to have an interaction like I just described because there's so many people using the platform. It's important to reiterate that YouTube is a search engine. People use YouTube the same way they use Google, but they prefer YouTube a lot of the times if they want to have something demonstrated to them. YouTube gets 3 billion searches every single month. Never in the history of mankind has an opportunity for you to get in front of more people existed at this low barrier to entry. So you've decided that you need to use YouTube to make video content to sell your product, but how do you decide what topics to cover? Well, first of all, let's talk about the YouTube search bar. The search bar is a secret weapon. If you use the search bar, you can type in words that are similar to what you're selling or phrases that you think people might be searching for, and you're gonna see a list of common questions people are typing and searching for, and then you can just copy those ideas and put them down in your notebook as video ideas. So that's number one. Another really cool tool for content ideation is called Answer the Public. Go to www.answerthepublic.com and type in keywords or questions about a topic that you think people might want to know about. And it's going to branch out and show you all kinds of different questions people are searching for already. So how about we search for how to get cheap plane tickets to Las Vegas? It's going to take a second and then it's going to show things like this. And you can choose from these different topics to create your video topics off of. This is great because it demonstrates what people are already searching for. If they're already searching for it, there's a good chance they might want to watch your video. Now, if you want to get really analytical and look at the data, you can use something like Uber Suggest at www.ubersuggest.com. You type in keywords that you think people are searching for or that you've proven they're searching for through the YouTube search bar or answer the public. And Uber Suggest will rank these in terms of popularity and difficulty. So if it's a high popularity and a low difficulty, that means that there's a huge hole waiting for you to fill with your content. If it's low popularity and high difficulty, then maybe stay away from it because not a lot of people are searching for it and there's already a lot of competition for those keywords. So if we're looking at flights to Las Vegas, let's do an Uber Suggest search for the term cheap flights Las Vegas. We can see some of them have higher popularity. Some of them have higher degree of difficulty or competition. And you, gotta, you wanna find something that's kind of in the middle, especially when you're starting out. Now, when you've settled on a video and you've made the content and you've uploaded it, you have to do testing. Don't just set it and forget it. That's a huge mistake. You should actually set goals for your video's performance. So set goals for views in the first 24 hours views in the first 48 hours, views in the first week, but also on that time, um, impressions. How many times does a video come up? Set goals for those. And if you aren't meeting those goals, what you should do is experiment with changing the thumbnail and the video title because YouTube looks at the thumbnail and it uses AI to extrapolate uh, ideas and search terms from your imagery and your title, those are the two things that people see the most also. Those are the two things that people also see first. So it's really important to the viewers. Your thumbnail and your title are critical to your own YouTube success. So this is something you might have to learn over time for your specific content type, the product that you're trying to sell, and who your audience is. So do testing. Videos that historically haven't done very well for you in the past could have huge spikes in viewership just by revisiting and tweaking something in the title or changing the thumbnail 
to match thumbnail of your other videos that are doing better. The way that I like to do the thumbnails is I'll try to get a single image or a pair of images and put them together that tell the story of what the video topic is about, but also communicate the feeling of my video or the energy of my video. Is it scary? Is it funny? Is it serious? Is it uh, relevant? Like all of those things are gonna dictate how you choose to illustrate your thumbnail. And they're all really, really, really important. So if you have something like uh, a video called, the stock market is going to crash, and it's all happy-go-lucky with a sunshine and blue and yellow colors and a smiling face, that's probably not gonna elicit the response that you're looking for from people searching for that topic. So think about catering your thumbnail to the actual topic of your video to give people a real sneak peek and do something that is compelling that draws them in. And same thing with your title. If your title isn't getting the views, maybe it's because you're using the wrong keywords and it's not helping you get found in Google search results. Or maybe it doesn't describe the question that somebody else is looking for an answer for. Now, a different topic on your thumbnails that I think is really important to talk about, but it's also really important that your thumbnails are high quality. Now, you might go on YouTube and find some thumbnails that are really low quality, but if they're low quality on purpose, that's different than if they're just lazy. A low quality on purpose thumbnail is actually harder to make it look low quality than you would think because it actually takes a lot of artistry and design to make a high performing, low quality thumbnail. There's some people that do this really well, but for the most part, I would just stay away from it. Do not just grab a random screen grab from your video if you actually want it to perform. Your thumbnail needs to be designed. If you are not a graphic designer, then I would recommend something like Fiverr, fiverr.com. They're five to 10 bucks starting. A thumbnail image might go all the way up to 20 or $30 if you're using it for commercial purposes, but it's worth it to have a high quality thumbnail image for your video because of how critical it is to your channel performance. Or maybe you have friends that do graphic design. You might not even realize that you have a friend in Facebook or Instagram that's a designer. Put a post out there and say, does anybody that I know do graphic design? I need help with YouTube thumbnails. You'll be surprised at how many people out there have done it or have the skills to help you do it. There's also pay by the month graphic design firms that give you unlimited editing for all kinds of different projects. You can have them do a thumbnail. You can make, have them do your email marketing. You can have them do your website images. You can have them make graphics that you put into your videos. So one that I've used in the past is Design Pickle, designpickle.com. And it's a flat fee and they hook you up with a designer. You give them all of your brand assets and then you just tell them what you want and they make it for you. And it's if you want revisions, it's super easy. So it kind of goes back to the whole testing thing. If you're not a graphic designer, I'd probably recommend going this route if you don't have a friend who can do it for you. And of course, when you're trying to figure out what your thumbnail style is gonna be, it's important to do some reconnaissance. Look at some of your favorite creators who are getting a lot of reviews and look at the style that they've been using for their thumbnails. I guarantee you if you have a, a channel with a lot of subscribers and a lot of views, their thumbnails are very strategic, very purposeful, and you could probably learn a thing or two by what they're doing. Um, you know, some of the biggest in the world would be obviously Mr. Beast and PewDiePie. Uh, from a business standpoint, you can also look at Alex Formosi, Jake Paul's impulsive channel has a lot of good thumbnails. And then from the, the kids side of things, you have five minute crafts channel has a lot of really good thumbnails. So go check those out and you'll see what I mean, where you scroll through and you see a theme, maybe the same facial expression, the same colors, the same design style. And if you scroll long enough, you'll actually see an evolution of their thumbnail strategy over time as they tested and figured out what works. This demonstrates how important it is for you to find a style that grabs attention and gets people to click. You'll see specific colors. You'll see with text, and then later you'll see without text. You'll see different expressions on their face. And sometimes you even see the same facial expression reused on multiple videos. The one thing's for certain, they're not lazy about it, and you should learn from that, and don't be lazy yourself. 
Now, when it comes to choosing the image for your thumbnail, there's really three ways to go about it. Number one is uh, you pull the video up on your computer and you pull a screen grab out of it. And maybe what you wanna do is specifically pose for the video. So here right now, I'm gonna pose for a thumbnail for this video. And this is actually gonna be the thumbnail that we use for this video, okay? Um, let's see, it's about YouTube content and marketing and business. And it's a course. So what if I just like, I'm gonna stand up, I'm gonna kind of lean in at the camera. I'm gonna give you a smile or I'm gonna hold my hands out with a serious look. I'm gonna grab one of these shots and turn it into a still. I'm gonna use one of them for the thumbnail. Uh, something I've used that I've found works out really, really well is pointing. In my videos, pointing at something does a really good job. <laughs> got, a, got a good frame. Maybe I'll have text on the screen right here and I'll point like this. Surprise face. Smiley face. Serious face. I'll, I'll use one of those to prove a point. The other thing you can do is you can actually take a specific photograph so that you're not trying to find the frame that has the best spatial expression and the best, uh, like the, the, the most clear look. Sometimes when you're trying to grab a frame from a video, it'll be blurry because there's a lot of motion and things like that. So sometimes you wanna just go take a specific photograph. It doesn't even have to be in the scene that your video is in. The other thing you can do that I think is pretty cool um, is you can use AI. You go to something like Mid Journey and you can actually like type in something about what the, the topic is about. Let's, let's actually do this for an example right here. Let's go to Mid Journey and type in YouTube content strategy. Let's see what it shows us. And then maybe we could cut out my face or like my, my person and put it over the AI generated image. So let me just, let me just stand like this. And then we'll use the AI tool remove.bg and we'll combine the two images, the one image from mid journey and then this image screen grab of my person over on top of it because people like looking at people, people like engaging with people. So I think it's really important that you have a face in the video and then what that face is communicating non-verbally says a lot about the video and if it's something that I wanna watch. If I'm concerned about the market, I'm more likely gonna click on a video of a guy with a shocked, scared face, maybe with fire and brimstone and red colors in the video than if those indicators aren't there. You'll also find with a lot of vloggers, they have these crazy facial expressions like, oh, oh my God, uh, <laughs> and they, 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 they've tested over time to figure out the, the star of the, the channel, what facial expression does this person make that gets the most views? And so maybe they'll have like a huh, like a confused look in their thumbnails and then a wild uh, kind of a look in their video or a crazy like head exploding picture like, ah, uh, you know, whatever. And they'll put those in the thumbnails and whichever one gets the most interactions generally drives which thumbnail style they're gonna be using long-term. And then here's the crazy thing, they continually test because in cultural seasons, what worked last year doesn't work again this year. And so sometimes they're gonna to have to change the trend of their thumbnail style. For example, take a look at Meet Kevin and uh, look at all of his facial expressions. You see a trend here. You see he's trying out different things. Here we have some of the same facial expressions. And then here's some different ones. Um, and then down below, we can see that he wasn't even using facial expressions. And here's another one, Graham Stephan, popular business-related YouTuber. Uh, you can see how his facial expressions have changed over time. His thumbnail styles include him or don't. And he's testing, trying to figure out what works for his channel also. One of the best things you can do is look at other videos in the same niche 
covering the same kind of topics and look at what sort of keyword performance the most popular videos are using and then try to mimic that. Don't just straight up copy them, but if it's working, it's working. If you're making a video about the best dog food for Huskies, think about what somebody searching for an answer surrounding that target would actually type into their keyboard. A lot of times people get really technical and their titles have jargon that most people don't search for. Like if you're actually an expert in your field, but your viewers or customers aren't, you, you want to be really careful that uh, the, the phrase is, you know, you can't see the forest of the tree. Sometimes if you are the expert in the field, you might be prone to writing your titles very technically or scientifically or expertly. And you might use jargon that your customers aren't searching for. They don't know that terminology or they don't, you know, know what it means yet because they're just introducing themselves to the topic. So you have to be careful that you are very uh, consumer friendly with your titles. So one example would be, you know, if you're selling dog food for a Husky, your title might be something like, you know, macro nutrient overview of, you know, whatever this type of dog food for Husky breed. Is anybody searching for that? You might want to rethink it and put yourself in the shoes of your customer sitting at their house or sitting at their office cubicle and they're asking a question. If they don't know all that stuff yet, what words would they type? What words will they say? Best nutritional dog food for Huskies over 22 pounds. You know, think commonly. Think with common sense. Think with the layman in mind. It's really, really important. And then the thumbnail would be complementary to your title. So what are the biggest thoughts that you can pull out of your title and put in the thumbnail? Because you don't want a whole lot of text in your thumbnail. So it might be like husky dog food healthiest, right? Or And, and that's the part like we, we don't know. That's for if to test nutrition test best healthy food like make the husky word big and the subtitle small and if it doesn't get the kind of performance you're looking for maybe flip that around or change your colors put a picture of a happy husky on the thumbnail but if it doesn't work put a picture of a sad husky on the thumbnail like you just don't know what's going to work until you do testing but that means you have to start and start doing something and again, you can use those tools that we already talked about, like Answer the Public and Uber Suggest, or even there's another one called SEM Rush, um, or you can use the YouTube search bar and put in similar questions that you think your customers are are uh, are, are typing and asking, and get different ideas. So if we search for Husky dog food in Uber Suggest, we see keyword ideas like Husky dog foods, Siberian Husky dog food best dog food for Husky to gain weight? What's the best dog food for Husky? So these are examples of actual search terms. A lot of people are typing. So you want to copy this. You don't want to go off on your own and reinvent the wheel. It's not going to work. You need to answer the question the masses are already asking. So once you research the topics people are searching for relating to your company, You've decided what content you're going to make. You have filmed it. You've edited it. You've produced it. You've picked out an amazing title. You've made a really compelling thumbnail image. How do you actually test? In YouTube, you can go to your, your channel studio and you click analytics. You click advanced view and you can see everything that there is about the performance of the videos. You can look at average watch time, how many minutes people are watching your content on average, average watch duration, and video views. Let's say your average watch time per video is like 45 seconds. And let's say your average view duration by video is only 20%. And let's say your total views by day three are usually around 2000. You do that a lot and you see those kind of trends that should start as your, your, your benchmark for your channel.
The thing is, you're not going to know what your metrics should be until you start doing it. Uh, you can't compare your videos to another channel that's been doing it for two or three years. So you have to start it by yourself. Then once you've got a few months of video content under your belt and put on the channel, that's when you go into the analytics. You start looking at where everything's ranking and you find your current benchmark. Then put your targets about 15 to 20% above that. And then once you start reaching those targets as your new average, set that as your benchmark and go 15 to 20% above that. And before you know it, if you manage your content performance like that, in a year or two, you're gonna have much better performance than if you just set it and forget it. So let's say your average videos are four minutes long, but you're only getting a 45 second average watch time. What does that mean? Well, maybe it means uh, your quality isn't very good. So in order to do better, you're gonna to wanna to improve your quality. Or maybe uh, you're losing a lot of people right when they start watching the video because it's really boring at first. You gotta jump in, you gotta do some research on how do I keep people engaged for longer? Or maybe you need you know, micro books throughout the video to keep them engaged and know what's coming up next so that they don't get bored and fall asleep and just move on to the next video. There's a million things that impact how long somebody stays watching your video, how long they watch your videos on average, how many views you get on average, and all of those things have different factors that drive them. So you're gonna to wanna to learn more about those things and implement what you learn into your actual videos. If you're having trouble getting views on your videos, then you might wanna think about your title and your thumbnail. Um, you wanna be specific, but not too technical. An example of a bad title in this scenario would be Husky Dog Food. We don't know what about it. Are you comparing different brands? Then say the brands in the title. Are you trying to figure out which one is cheaper or most nutritionist or best for elderly Huskies? Put those details in the title, but you don't want to get too technical and add words that your customers aren't even searching for. If you have a problem with people not watching enough of the video, it might be because right off the bat, you don't get into it. So for average watch time, you might want to make the video more exciting, more interesting, remove all of the stuff that you think is interesting from an artistic perspective. Chances are most people don't care. Get into it, answer the question, and be done with it. And if you need people to watch longer, give them a reason to watch longer. Tell them what's coming up. Tell them that the, the other thing that you want to know, I'm going to talk about in a second. Tell them that you're going to want to stick around for this next part. Trust me. Things like that, little micro hooks or micro previews about what's coming out in the video next. And now let's talk about the description of your video. That's also extremely important and not just for SEO purposes. The description box in the YouTube video can hold about 5,000 characters, but on a mobile device preview, it gets truncated to only about 120 characters. That's like a sentence or most of a sentence. So when people are scrolling through different videos in their search results, your description needs to be compelling. It needs to grab attention and be a part of your communication strategy with the potential viewer. So you have to think about what they're looking at. They're scrolling and they see a thumbnail, they see a title, and they see a sentence below it. You need to think about how those three things interact to tell a story because people can spot what they're looking for very quickly. And don't just write a description and post it and never think about it again. Open it up on your phone, open it up on your computer, and go find it in a search result and see what it looks like. If it doesn't look how you want it to, or YouTube strips something out, or YouTube hides something, then go back and test it until it looks exactly how you want it to look for your viewer's experience. Something that we've learned recently is that when YouTube shows a description preview, it actually looks for links in your description and it skips it. <laughs> so if you hope that uh, your first line in the video description says, click here to learn more with a link, that's not even gonna show up in the preview. That's why it's so important to test because we don't know what YouTube is gonna show people when they try to optimize the user experience. That doesn't mean don't use links though. Links are so incredibly important, not only to the, the user experience, but also to your success selling 
through your e-commerce website. So think about what's important to YouTube. YouTube doesn't really care about how much money you make on the platform. They care about the user or viewer experience. And if a user or viewer has a good experience, then you, the content creator, will get rewarded. So it's really important to think about your descriptions from a user or viewer first standpoint. Don't architect them to maximize your ability to make money. You're going to get caught up in a problem because sometimes your best sales strategy isn't the same as what's best for the customer's viewing experience. So for example, if you feature a dog food <laughs> or whatever in your video and you have a bunch of them, you should probably list them out because after watching the video, people want to take action. So you want to make it really easy for them to take action. You want to organize them in order with timestamps and rank them based on what you said or covered in your video. And also make sure that they're accurate. Test them, click on them, make sure they actually work. The worst thing is when you find a really interesting video, you click on the link and just to find that the link is broken. Maybe the video is old or maybe whoever wrote the description did it wrong in the first place or something on the website had changed. So always be making sure that you are closing the loop for your viewers because that creates a positive user experience, which creates higher watch times, which creates uh, longer view durations, which tells YouTube's algorithm that your video is relevant, desirable, interesting, and they're gonna start showing it to other people. Suggested videos are the number one way that your videos will get seen by other people. It's not from your subscribers. It's not from your ads. It's from suggested videos when people search something. So you want to do everything possible with your thumbnail, title, and description and your video content itself to make sure that people like it and engage with it. YouTube knows when somebody interacts with your description. That's one of the engagement metrics that they watch to find out if your video is relevant, interesting, or useful to the viewer. And these links in your description don't just have to be all about selling something. If you are a vlogger you and, and you go to a place, maybe you wanna say thank you for using their space or their store or their coffee shop by putting a link to their location. It also allows people to feel like you're more relatable if they could see the place that you went. It also creates something interesting for the viewer to do, which drives engagement. This is all really good stuff. Or if you have a vlogging channel and uh, you talked about a product that you just love, even if you're not getting paid for it, it's not a bad idea to link in the description for that product to give it exposure and maybe tell them, hey, tell them that Rolling Fortune sent you. And then maybe that's an opportunity for you to build goodwill with that brand. And they're gonna wanna reach out and do a brand partnership because of how much exposure you gave them for free. So links are so, so, so important. If you're trying to make money on retail e-commerce, they're the most important. When I do a video where I compare different things or teach you about how something works and it's relating to a product that I'm selling, I do a really good job at explaining in the description exactly what you're looking at in the video, where it was found, what I rank each product, and then a link to my website where you can go buy it. This is so important. This is the number one most important thing that you can do once you capture people's attention with your thumbnail, videos, and descriptions, and you engage them with your content, the next step in the viewer process is to purchase something or learn more. So they're gonna to want to go to your website and learn more. They're going to want to subscribe or they're gonna to wanna to click on the link in the description for the product that you just sold them on. Also in your description, you really should learn how to build a table of contents. YouTube makes this really easy by if you kind of just write it out as if it exists, YouTube will take your notes and turn your video into the different chapters that you wrote in the description. So the way it works is, for example, in this video, you can see a, a timestamp and then you can see the, the title that I gave that section. And then if you go up into the actual YouTube video, you can see how YouTube implements it. 
And then also, if your video gets picked up by Google for search results, it's going to use these different chapters and suggest them to people searching for a topic specifically based on your table of contents chapter title. It is so incredibly important. It also makes the viewer experience better, which keeps people on the platform longer, which YouTube loves. That's their number one goal, by the way. So anything you can do in your video content process to keep people engaged in the platform longer is going to be good because YouTube will be eager to share your content, share your channel with more people. And you want people to have a good time with your videos and make it easy for them to find what they're looking for. And so if you have a table of contents, then they can scroll their mouse down along the, the timeline and see the titles that you gave each section and find exactly what they're looking for. That's going to give people the most value. It's going to drive the most conversion. It's going to drive the most engagement. So your table of contents is critical. Every single video that you do should have a table of contents. In your description, something else that a lot of people miss is cross-linking social platforms. It's such an easy thing to do. If you are selling your own personal brand or a product that you think people might want to engage with or learn more about, the best thing that you can do for helping them get connected with your brand is to post your different social platforms. Post your Facebook link, your Twitter link, your, your uh, TikTok link, your Instagram link, your Facebook link, and of course, your website so that if people want to find more, it's right there. The worst thing that happens is somebody's watching your video and they're really, really interested, but then it's a struggle for them to connect with you on social platforms. Don't put up roadblocks. Remove roadblocks. Remove barriers for people to engage with you. So now let's talk about the overall recommended description layout. You want to keep it very organized, and what I do is I make a template for each of my YouTube channels so that they're always the same. Because a lot of times you have people uh, who are subscribers or fans of your brand or fans of your company, and they're gonna keep coming back, and it's really helpful for them to know what to expect. I think everybody likes knowing what to expect. It makes the buying process easier, and it uh, just makes the user experience nicer because humans are great at pattern recognition. So we see the same thing over and over again, that turns into what we expect, and when our expectations are met, we have a better feeling, which drives positive conversion. Experiment with this a little bit, and when you find something that works for you, stick with it. Create a, a notepad document and just copy and paste it into each one, and then fill out the blanks. You wanna start with a short description, this is one or two sentences that provide a persuasive, compelling message about the high-level topic of the video, followed by relevant links. Link to the products that you're talking about that you have for sale, or link to the brand that you are partnering with, or link to your website. This is the most important part of the description because it's at the very top, and it's the first thing that people see when they click on your description, and it's the things that drive revenue for you. After that, give them the table of contents. Because sometimes people will go to the description and look at the table of contents to find what they're looking for before actually watching the whole video. So you wanna have it up near the top. And something else that a lot of people don't do, but I think is a really powerful trick in YouTube content strategy is have a list of other videos that you think people might wanna see. So this might be your most popular videos and you just pick like three or four of them you give them a little title followed by the link. And this is great for YouTube because YouTube loves it when your content keeps people engaged on the platform. That's one of YouTube's highest metrics for if they think your content is relevant and high quality. The longer you can keep people engaged on the YouTube platform, the more YouTube platform will have warm, fuzzy feelings for you and the better chance is that they'll recommend your videos again. And then very last, put your contact information your social platforms, maybe your email address and phone number, things like that. And this is especially critical if you are an e-commerce retail store, if you have uh, a customer service team or you, know, you need people to reach out to, to get more information, put that in the YouTube description. So many people just don't and they rely on you to click through links and jump through hoops. And every single time you have your potential customer take an action, the 
possibility that they're actually going to follow through with conversion or contacting you drops. Watch the video, click the description, scroll down, click the link to your website, find your contact page. Every single time an action happens for a customer or a viewer to get what they want, the less and less potential they have to actually do it. One last note on the description strategy is do not keyword stuff. Don't stuff your description with SEO keywords. It won't work. Google knows what you're doing. YouTube knows what you're doing. All it's going to do is eat up valuable space in your description. Don't do it. You can use keyword stuffing in the tag section. That's where words that describe different topics that you're talking about go, but do not put it in your description. It's a terrible idea for a lot of different reasons. And really the rule of thumb for the entire thing is just try to make something human centric. Don't make it a sales pitch. Write something that adds value. If you don't know how to do this, find someone to help you or use one of the AI tools like ChatGPT or Jasper.ai and they will help you come up with compelling, persuasive, value-adding, human-centric words and sentences to put in your description. The more engaging, interesting, compelling, and value-adding your content is, your description, your title and thumbnail, the higher possibility is that somebody's going to share it with a friend. And so in the analytics, something that's really important is to look at the first 30 seconds. This is so critical because for the longest time, so many people have done it wrong. And even today, people are still doing it wrong. And it's a huge problem. When YouTube was new, people made these cool, flashy 3D animated logos, and they treated it like a TV show where the first 90 seconds was like a branded intro about the story of the characters and the feel of the show and the company who made it and who the actors were. And people took that methodology and brought it into YouTube because at the time that was normal. But if you're still doing that today, you're making a huge mistake. My advice to you is in the first 30 seconds, you should tell somebody what their problem is that this video is about and explain what they're going to learn and then get into the answer as fast as possible. So here's an example of a bad first 30 seconds. I mean, in, I kind of did it in this video because it's a course and I wanted you to know who I am. It's not some short video that you just randomly found on the internet. But if I was going to make this video for my YouTube channel, it would have, and, and I did it like that, it'd be a problem. Hey guys, my name is Chris Nelson. I started business in 2009 and I did a lot of experimenting with YouTube. I made $20 million just on direct to YouTube uh, e-commerce sales. And, you know, if you're like me, and you want to learn more about videos, I'm going to go into that and, and explain to you how I do it. And, um, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about my company and whatever. And, you know, yesterday I was filming a video and I just had a thought like, Hmm, I wonder if anybody else is thinking about this too. And then I started thinking about what I should plan out and what I should say. You, you lost me. I'm gone. Don't start your videos like that. If this was a YouTube video for my YouTube channel, I would probably say something more along the lines of, what's up guys, it's Chris with Rolling Fortunes. And if you're trying to figure out the best title strategy for your YouTube videos to get more clicks, check this out. The first thing you should do is do your research on what keywords people are using. Okay, see, <laughs> we're, we're done. Um, the first version was full of fluff. It was low energy. It was drawn out. It had a whole bunch of information in there that you don't really care about. Because remember, YouTube is a search engine. You're not the star of the show. You are here to provide value. So do it and do it quickly. The second version was a, a one second intro. Here's who I am. That's, that's all you need. You don't need to spend time on your background. You don't need to spend time on what your company is. You don't even need to show me your logo. None of that stuff matters. And then I told you what question you have. All right, so that validates that you're in the right place. And I did it really quickly. 
Do you want to know how to make the best YouTube titles? And three, I jump right into the answer. Well, in a minute, we're going to talk about it. But first, let me, no, 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 screw that. Hi, the question, the answer. Once you get into the answer, you can take as long as you want. As long as it's adding value and it's engaging and it's high quality and it's still telling people what they want to hear. But don't spend a lot of time in that first 30 seconds. And then if you are covering a topic that's multifaceted or has optional answers or solutions, then maybe say, first we're going to talk about this, then we're going to talk about this, and then we're going to talk about this, so that you kind of give people a framework for what to expect. It's so important for people to know what to expect if they're going to decide to keep watching your video, because watching your video is a commitment. And people don't like committing their time to something on YouTube that they don't know is gonna be really beneficial. So tell people up front what to expect. And then when you're in those multifaceted explanations, it's important to give micro hooks down the road to keep people engaged and listening. So um, uh, one, one, one way to do this would be an example. You wanna use a tool like Answer the Public or Uber Suggest where you put in your keywords and it tells you what people are actually searching for. Now, if you're not sure how technical to be, we're gonna cover that next. But first, let me just finish this up. You see how I like interrupted myself and I said, if you keep watching, so it'd be something like, in just a minute, in just a second, now pay attention because we're gonna cover that next, or you know, you're not gonna wanna miss the next part. You know, give them a hook to keep them interested and keep them watching further into it. And the other thing you wanna do with keeping people engaged is evaluate if you should have a musical soundtrack, if you should have camera movement, if you should have sound effects. And there's a ton of stuff out there to teach you um, how to do those things. And the short answer is, yeah, probably. It's part of having high production value, which is really important to communicate to people that you put effort into the video and that it's worth their time to stick around and watch. If all I did was have this camera set up and one shot the whole time, it'd be really, really boring. But that's why I put B-roll in to illustrate different things that I'm doing. And that's why I have camera movement to keep you engaged. In this video, I don't have a soundtrack because it's an educational course, it's a learning. But if it's something that is really interesting or a, or a short educational video or something entertaining, then you might wanna consider having music. And you're gonna to wanna to play around with the levels. Generally speaking, with a musical soundtrack, you don't need a lot of volume. So if you think it's too high, it's probably way too high, especially if people are wearing headphones. And then with sound effects, Normally, the answer is no. Every once in a while, if a specific shot calls for it, yeah, go for it. If you're trying to be funny, a little comic relief. But for most professional, you know, selling retail company videos, you're not going to want to use sound effects. And if you want your vlog to be considered professional, you also would not use sound effects. Now, if you're making, uh, you know, entertaining content for children, now that's a totally different story. Stuff as many sound effects in as you can. When we've made stuff for like uh, educational videos for kids, little boing, 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 or ha, 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 ha kind of sound effects are so key to keeping their attention and it helps them stay glued to the content and digest as much of it as possible. But for adults and specifically people who are looking for answers to their questions, don't do sound effects, just stay away. Now, real quick, I'm gonna explain how I set up this shot. If you go into part two of this video, we're actually gonna demonstrate exactly what we use to make this shot piece by piece by part number. We're gonna talk about different budget types. If you're just starting out, this is what you should do. If you've got a little bit of money and you're just starting out, this is what you should do. If you're already making videos, you wanna do them better, take these steps. But I have three lights turned on. There's one right here. There's one right here and there's one behind me. So this gives the illumination on the front. It gives my uh, scene some depth and it lights up the back of my body and my head and my shoulders so that it gives some separation and gives the scene some depth. Now in front of me, I have a Sony camera with an external mic. So my mic is right there and then I actually have a teleprompter here with my notes. Now, 
I know the topic, um, you know, so I don't need to just read from it, but it's there so that if I forget where I was at, I can look at it and get back on track for you. If you want to learn more about exactly what my camera setup is, then check out part two with Josh. Now the moment you've all been waiting for. Let's talk about how to make money on YouTube. We've talked a lot about kind of the science of YouTube content strategy, some tips and tricks and best practices with uh, getting your videos found, engaging with the search engine function, um, how to create your content to be engaging. But once you've done all that stuff, how do you actually make money on YouTube? The, the first thing is the most obvious thing. If, if you're not selling anything, all you got to do is get views with content that follows YouTube's community guidelines, and they're going to let you get paid for it. They'll use AdSense. Once you reach a certain number of subscribers and a certain number of video views, you become eligible for channel monetization. What this means is you can participate in the Google AdSense program for YouTube. So let me break it down. If you just fire up a brand new YouTube channel, you're not going to be able to make money on ads. Google doesn't just let anybody throw up a video and make ads. You have to become eligible. And the way that you become eligible is by having a verified account where you put your phone number in the account and you verify it with like a number, you know, like a security code. Once you've met those qualifications, you get a notice from YouTube saying, congratulations, you're now eligible for monetization. But it doesn't happen automatically because monetization on YouTube runs through a system called AdSense. This is a Google advertising tool. So you go to AdSense.com, you sign up with your Google account that owns your YouTube account. You have to put in all of your personal information, your name, your email, your address, your phone number, your social security number, or you can register your business instead of you personally and put in your federal employer ID number, your EIN, and then you link a bank account. Once you have the AdSense account set up, you take your AdSense account number, and then go into the Google platform, go to settings, find monetization, and then you link your YouTube channel to your Google AdSense. Then if you have a video that you want to monetize, which just means a video that you want to show ads on, you have to actually select monetize this video. You can set it up after that point where by default, all of your videos are selected for monetization. But if you haven't done this yet, you have to go through each one and turn monetization on Otherwise, you're not going to get any money because YouTube won't show any ads. You have to decide to interrupt the viewer experience with ads. So, you know, a couple of years ago, YouTube launched YouTube Premium, where you pay like 15 to 20 bucks a month to not have to see ads on YouTube. And you can still get AdSense monetization revenue, even from people who are using YouTube Premium, because... YouTube shares that user's monthly subscription dollars with the videos that are monetized. So whether you've got somebody who doesn't use YouTube Premium, if somebody is logged in or if they aren't, none of that matters. If it shows an ad on your video, then you get paid for it. You get credit for it and it racks up. And then once you reach a certain threshold, YouTube does a payout to your bank account. Now remember, this is taxable income. Even though it's technically passive, once you get past the point of making the video and launching it, it's still going to be reported on your taxes. So YouTube will send you a 1099K form at the end of the year that you have to turn into your uh, tax account. So if you made $10,000 on YouTube last year through AdSense monetization, you're going to get a, a tax form in the mail, YouTube saying, hey, we paid this guy 10 grand. IRS, you better be looking for it. So you, you do have to turn it into the IRS, but that's okay because everything that I bought for this studio is a tax rate that goes against my taxable income. Now, if you want to learn more about taxable income and deductions and expenses, 
I have another course that's all about you know business basics and starting up a business. So you can go check out the preview for that video. Go to rollingforces.com, find the courses and find the one that's called Business 101. But that's a topic for a completely different video. But at that point, you're well on your way to getting monetized and making money on YouTube through AdSense advertising. And it's just a numbers game. The more views you can get, the more money you can make because you showed more people, more ads, period. Some of the bigger channels where their videos are getting six, seven, eight hundred thousand views per video, uh, and they're making a lot of videos, they might get 40 to 60 to $80,000 a month in AdSense revenue. But some of the smaller ones that are maybe only getting 10,000 views to 40,000 views for, per video, maybe they're only making a few thousand dollars a month. We have one channel that makes about $8,000 a month on AdSense revenue, and we're not even trying to do that. We're making video content that drives traffic to the website, but we make 40 videos a month, and our views are very, very low per video. So we're talking, you know, 1,500 to 10,000 views per video in a six month period. And so our goal isn't even AdSense at that point, but this is a byproduct of being monetized on YouTube. The second best way to make money on YouTube is brand partnerships. If you can create an audience, um, one of the channels that I work with just passed the 2 million subscriber mark and a lot of their videos have brand partnerships. So they will get companies reaching out to them saying, Hey, uh, it looks like your target demographic, your audience is the same people that we're trying to sell to. Could we send you a product and you demonstrate it on your YouTube channel? It helps them with brand awareness and direct sales because then the company that has the 2 million subscribers on a YouTube channel, they're already making this video and they can incorporate the brand's placed product. And then if you're watching the video, you might see that you might think it's interesting. You click on the description, you find the link where that thing is listed and I'm going to click it and go to their website who sent me this product that I'm putting in the video to review or, or, you know, pitch to you. And then every single time you click on the link and you buy something then I get paid for it. Or maybe it's just a tracker that tells tells them how many people I sent to their website and they pay me upfront. So in, in that scenario, that company is making uh, four to $10,000 per brand deal. And they're doing two or three of these every single month. And that's a major part of their revenue strategy. So you either get paid up front and you provide a certain number of views. So let's say I get paid $10,000 up front to, you know, talk about this roll of tape. Scotch blue number 2090 is the best one inch painter's tape out there. In this video, while we're doing our home renovations, this is what we're going to be using. If you're in the market for tape, check us out, click the link in the description below and you know, go get it yourself. Okay. Let's say they scotch paid me 10 grand. They didn't it was just an example. And they said, you need to per you, you need to deliver 200,000 views of this tape in your videos in six months. So I need to be making videos that incorporate that brand deal product placement enough times that I reach that 200,000 views in total of all my videos. So my videos are getting 10,000 views each. I need to make 20 of them that feature the Scotch tape to hold up my end of the brand partnership. The other way to do it is you send me the product, I'll put it in the video for free, and then I get paid an affiliate commission every time somebody goes to your website. Let's say you give me a promo code that gives you 10% off. The customer uses my code on your website and any dollar amount that they buy, I get three, five, six, seven, or 10% off of. Or if I send 10,000 visitors to your website, I get a dollar per visitor, no matter if they buy anything or not. So everything's negotiable in these brand deals or brand partnerships or product placement deals. It just depends on what you think you can get that's a win-win between you and the brand partner.
but you can't do any of that kind of deal until you have an audience. So it's really important to first, before you go out looking for brand partnerships or brand deals, you need to build an audience. You need to have videos that are getting views. And once you get to that point, something that's really important is either on your website or in your YouTube video descriptions, you should probably have a call to action for potential brand partners saying, hey, I'm open to doing product placement. I'm open to doing affiliate marketing. I'm open to doing a brand deal. Email me here and list your email. That way, if somebody sees your content and they're interested in working with you, you're removing barriers, removing obstacles for them to know if you even want to do it in the first place so they're not wasting their time. This encourages people to reach out and is going to give you a better chance at getting those lucrative brand deals. The third way that you can make money is similar to the brand deal through affiliate marketing, but this is all through Amazon. Doing Amazon affiliate sales is easy. First, you need to set up an affiliate account. You go to the Amazon affiliate website, you put in all of your personal information, including your name, email, address, social security number, business name, EIN, bank account, and then you're off to the races. Basically what happens is anytime you talk about a product in your video and you want to sell it, if it exists on Amazon, there's a pretty good chance that you can say, if you want to buy this thing that I just told you about, click the link in the description below and you can get one yourself. That link is a special URL specifically for your account. It's a tracking link so that Amazon knows somebody watched Chris's video, they clicked his link and they made a purchase. Let's give him a commission on that sale because they want people out here pushing products that they're selling because that builds up an affiliate network of different types of advertising essentially to drive people to Amazon. So I do that today with books because I'm a huge advocate of learning and reading. And so I have a whole bookshelf store section on my website, rollingforces.com. And if you click on any of them to buy yours, it just goes to Amazon using an affiliate link. And you can get 2%, 3%, 4%, 5%, 6%, or 7% depending on the category. So, you know, books, you're looking at, you know, 5 to 6%. Home smart gadgets, you're looking at three to four percent. It all depends on the margin that the seller has and also how much Amazon um, is willing to give you on any given sale based on what they normally make as far as profit margin on that product line. So you sign up for the Amazon affiliate program, then you go to Amazon.com, you find the product that you want to sell, you click the link to get your link, you copy that link, and you put it in the description of your video. So something like click here to buy the blue tape and you paste the link in your description and voila, you have e-commerce happening for you without ever putting up a store. And of course, one of the most powerful ways to make money on YouTube without having to be a world famous celebrity getting millions of views per, per video is to be the expert, do product reviews and drive traffic to your own e-commerce retail website. If you make and sell hats and you have a YouTube channel all about hats and people watch your videos, they probably want to buy your hats. The best thing you can do is make an e-commerce website store that has all of your hats for sale. And if you talk about one of the hats in your video, link to it. That's it. You don't have to do tracking. You don't have to pay yourself a commission. You don't have to wait for somebody else to pay you a commission. You just drive traffic from YouTube to your website by creating compelling, interesting content. Remember, there's a part two to this video where we talk about my camera setup here, and we talk about uh, different types of camera setups. We're gonna talk a little bit about camera settings, uh, and also there is a worksheet study guide that you should download. Um, if you've already watched this, make sure you watch that too. And of course, sign up for the email. Uh, every time that we post a new video on YouTube, sometimes people don't see it. Every time I make a new course, sometimes people don't see it. So sign up for the email list to make sure that you stay up to date on everything happening in the Rolling Fortunes world.